now, uh, and he, he's been doing a great job of helping me kind of organize these and get, get my mind going. Um, so we're going to, there we go. All right. We're going to get started. And I want to start off with a question for Chris. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about cultivating a culture of excellence. So when it comes to being excellent, how do you prioritize the process over the result? Um, that's a good question. And uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad someone asked that the last time. Um, the first thing that it has to come from is really has to come from the director's uh, vision of what they want the program to be. Um, because, uh, you know, I got told a long time ago, my first, second year teacher, I had one of my mentor teachers, he came up to me and said, Chris, if anything in the band doesn't sound good or doesn't look good or isn't going the way you want it, it's a reflection on you. And so that's something that I think about a lot. And so first of all, if, 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 you, if you have the thought of like, well, I, you know, the, that, the, that the, the trophies matter more or the piece of plastic matters more or the, you know, that kind of stuff, then that's going to that's gonna rub off on the kids. Um, a lot of that starts in sixth grade where you start, it, it, and start impressing upon them that the process of learning music is sacred and that what we do as a craft is very important. And because uh, like to me, like this is the first time they've gotten to do something so unique that's playing music. It's so different than they've ever done. And so I want them to know that this is such a special thing they're, uh, they're getting to do. And so impressing upon them there um, and then moving into understanding your kids a whole lot and developing relationships with them. You know, there, there's the, the ultimate goal is that your kids will want to do things and want to play your music and want to do a great job because they're intrinsically motivated to do it. And, and, and your top kids are, are going to be that way. And it's real important that you, you, you stretch those kids and that you always give them more to do and, and motivate them intrinsically. But remember, you're going to have students in your program that need that carrot, that need that extrinsic motivation. And so part of your job is starting with them and helping them with that, but kind of weaning them off of that as they get older to, uh, to, to become more intrinsically motivated. And that's, that's the key. If, if you're always trying to reward things with a prize or you're awarded with a trophy or with a grade, the students will only ever work so hard for that. They'll never work harder than that. And so the, the goal is, is to try to, in your daily practice, your daily band class, is to try to always give them the sense that they're in complete ownership of the product, that they're in complete ownership of their craft, and you want to keep pushing those students the best you can to have them be intrinsically motivated. Um, I think for me, you know, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, when we talk about honor band or UIL or festivals or things like that, I, I don't talk about those things past this is what it is, this is what we're going to do, and this is what it entails. And, and I go back to, you know, I talk to my kids about like, I want you to, when we're done with this process of learning the music, I want you to have a, a musically fulfilling experience that's way beyond what we, what we take to contest. And that's done every day. You know, it always goes back to, even if they come to class unprepared, it's like, well, you're not ready for the, you're not ready to perform this music yet. And I always say it as like, you know, the audience needs that, like you need to perform that. It's not, well, you're gonna get a two at contest or a three at contest. It's like, we, we need to hold it up to the standard of we're, we're the performers and we're there to perform and, and present this music for, for our audience. And so I think that's something, um, you know, also I would, you know, always look towards yourself as you're trying to change the culture of your school or set the culture, like try to figure out like, what are you saying without saying it, you know, cause the kids pick up on everything we do. And so, what are we saying? How are we saying things in rehearsal? How are we talking amongst the staff like it? You know, are we talking about it in terms of, I gotta go get my one, or I gotta go do this, that, or the other, or are we trying to do it from the standpoint of, you know, because here's the thing, if, if, if you get the kids to be intrinsically motivated and buy in and want to do things because it's the right thing to do and to be great ensemble members, the, the awards just really take care of themselves. They really, really do. Um, and I would just, you know, encourage you to always be thinking about what you're telling your students verbally and non-verbally and how your staff is doing that as well. So that's, that's my answer. And you guys can hop on the end of those questions if you want. Um, but in the process or going on kind of Susan, how do you get your kids to prioritize band like they do other activities like clubs and sports and things like that? 
Um, it's a really good question for me, actually, because I, I don't, I don't want them to prioritize band over their other things. I nurture that, um, and my school climate nurtures um, being involved as many activities as you can, um, because in high school you can't, um, and so uh, I don't really, I don't really push them to, to prioritize band over anything else. That said. Um, I work with them on their sport. I, um, I find out what their schedule is. I find out what, um, what they're doing in their, in the, during school stuff and their outside of school stuff. Um, in doing that, they realize that I care um, and that I don't want them to choose and they work harder. Um, and if we ever do have a conflict um, that, that I tell them, that communication is key. And I encourage my kids, you tell me, I don't want your mom to tell me, you tell me, let's develop that trust. Let's develop that relationship that you can talk to me about a conflict, that it's not scary. And then they learn that, that talking to adults is a good thing to do. Um, and so uh, it, there, lots of lots of different things where I will give a lot. And then when we get around and we'll talk about seasons, you know, this is band season right now. And so if I worked with a kid on their insert, whatever, when it comes to band season, I'll say, now, look, I've given you a lot of flexibility. It's band time now. You understand it's like, oh, yeah, I get it. I get it. So um, <laughs> I don't I don't expect them to make a, a strong choice. Um, and a lot of them will tell me, you know, I, I know I'm, this is my last year I'm doing my sport. I'm choosing band in high school all the way. So thank you for letting me, uh, you know, letting me miss that thing or that other thing. And I think that's important in developing that, um, that culture of excellence that the kids know that you care about them, not just how they play their instrument, but about their whole person. Um, and heck, I mean, I try to go to their little things as much as I can and what, go watch them play volleyball or whatever. I mean, usually at school anyway. So I just stop by the gym on my way. Um, and so I, I think that, that that's a really, really great quest, qu question. Now in that, you have to develop a great relationship with your athletic um, department um, and all the club sponsors. And when they realize that you're all working together, I think that it, everyone will come together to encourage the kids to communicate and split their time the very best that, that they can. Absolutely. Now, Corey, we're, we're, again, we're talking about excellence, excellence, excellence. Now, what do you see consistently? What traits do you consistently see in excellent band programs? And we know that excellence looks different in different places. So, so what does that look like? Well, with me particularly, I think when I walk into someone's band hall, the excellence starts from the good leadership from the top. So I feel like if you are expecting excellence out of your kids, you need to be showing excellence. And we were talking about this last time. Your kids and your program is going to be a shadow of what you do. So I'm, I will never ask someone to do something that I'm not going to be willing to do myself. So if I'm telling my kids be here on time, then I need to be here way earlier than they are to know that that's something serious and not running up to the band hall with my keys, dropping my McDonald's and all of this stuff at the same time. So that they, so we know that that's something that's really serious. Um, I think you have to have great communication. And that's not only with your kids, but with the other teachers on campus, with your staff, with the administrators. So the, everybody's always knowing what's going on because if you try to take on too much by yourself, then that's when you start hating the job. And, and that's the complete opposite of excellence, what we're looking for. Um, I think there has to be clear organization throughout the program that it's very clear that I'm a part of this and I know what's happening and I know where this goes and I know where I can find this information and that I know I can ask anybody a question without feeling like I'm going to um, get my head chopped off for asking them to. Um, I think it's a program that really encourages you to have a love of music and to have fun while you're doing it. And let's be honest, a lot of our kids are not going to be band directors. They're not going to major in music. Some of them may not even play their instrument again after middle school. But you also, you always want them to have a desire to appreciate the art form for what it is. And um, sometimes I think it's easy to lose sight of that. Um, it's one that teaches more than music, teaching your kids how to be a good kid, a good person, um, how to say please, thank you, and all the other manners that go along with that. 
and how to give a good handshake for crying out loud. Like it teaches you how to be a real person. Like I think there's so many opportunities for us to teach our kids more than just the music. Um, and it's one that everyone contributes. Like if you walk into a band program and you see the head director doing everything and the, like you, you've never given responsibility to an assistant director, then they don't have the same buy-in that you do. And it could be something as like, you are in charge of the uniforms. You are in, like, there has to be buy-in in the program for everyone to make it excellent. So yeah, that's what I see. Yeah. <laughs> That's good stuff. It is. This, this you can see people feverishly taking notes and I'm doing the same. This is really good. I love it. And so on that kind of trail of of, of giving folks responsibility to have buy-in in the program kind of turns us towards leadership and we know our students have the opportunity to be leaders um but Mr. Davis, what is the value of having student leaders and how are student leaders utilized on your campus? Yeah, I think Corey just, he, he must have gotten my question or something and like answered part of it, but that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give him a break on that sure, one. these are original thoughts. Thank you. Yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you all for being here, John. Thanks for doing this again. Yeah, you know, Student leaders, and, and I'm going to take this from two perspectives, as I told the panel earlier, you know, not everybody on here is a junior high director, not everybody on here is a high school director, but I've had the privilege of doing both. So, you know, in the junior high world, we didn't have, quote unquote, a student leadership team. So there are some of you that have junior high student leadership teams. I know um, Corey does it through section leaders, you know, so and some people just pick people to kind of lead, but at the high school level, you know, we have an organized, you know, specific SLT, student leadership team. But in both disciplines or both areas, they are extremely valuable because they are the doers. They are the communicators. They are the ones who literally represent the ideals and, and, and thoughts that you have in your mind of what you want your program to be. And so when you are whether it's a kid that you just asked to get up and go, you know, hey, uh, Johnny, will you come over here and do this, that, or the other? You asked Johnny to do that because you knew that Johnny would do it in a way that would show exactly what you wanted the other people to see. And so what you do is you find students that exhibit the traits that you want to be highlighted in your program, and then your program will become that very thing. One of the things Corey said that I thought was, was crucial and critical, they will do what you, they'll become you. See, it, what people don't understand is they say, a lot of times they say they want one thing, but they won't, be, they're not willing to be the thing that they say they want. And kids are not blind and stupid. They are very perceptive and very smart. And the thing that you say you want, you have to be willing to go there with them and for them. Okay, and, and even in the high school setting, I think one of the things that the kids were shocked was that their directors are willing to do everything they're asking them to do. And some of you know that's not the case everywhere. You know, sometimes it's do as I say, not do as I do. And a lot in the places where it's do as I do, the kids will follow you anywhere and they'll do anything you ask them. And they develop that love for being around other people. A couple things I wrote down just just to think about on this was, you know, I said before, they're the actual doers and communicators of the, what I call the intangible view of the tangible thing that you're trying to create, because all these things that we're speaking are intangible, yet once they come, once they come to fruition, it's actual something that they literally seem to put their hands on and become a part of. Um, you know, the, the student leaders facilitate, I put this, they facilitate the overall goals of the program. You know, they're the ones who, who actually facilitate what it is you're trying to do. I don't care if it's middle school section leader or high school drum major. They're still doing what you think the program should be doing, and they're representing that. You know, um, I had the privilege of being a part of, of the SASE group, and, and it's really interesting. We talk about um, kids infecting their band with positivity, you know. And that's at, at both levels, you know, in being able to infect their band 
with positivity. That's not a Rory Davis. I didn't come up with that. That that was a Saturday. <laughs> I'm not going to take you know credit for that. But I believe that. But I also believe that the director has to do that. Okay, because you can't be a tyrant all the time. Notice I said all the time. There are times where you kind of get that 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 as it, my kids call it the joyful hammer. Some of the people in my church they call me a joyful hammer because they say, "Man, I mean business, but I do it with joy." You know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but you have to infect your band program with positivity because oh at the end of the day if they don't enjoy it what did you accomplish you know why are all you band directors because somewhere somebody did something that you enjoyed and now you want to give that to the other people the, the thing that you experienced you're, you're wanting to give it to someone else that's why you know that somebody did something right okay or else you wouldn't want to give it to them who wants to give something some someone something bad right Okay, so I won't tangent it off here. John, you said, how do we utilize student leaders in our program? Mm -hmm. um, we let them lead. We, we give them uh, specific information as to what we want them to do. We communicate it in a very clear and concise manner, and then we let them lead. And we meet with them, you know, and because I'm, I'm an old man compared to, when my kids see me, they see an old man. Even though I'm Mr. Davis, you know, ha ha, yeah, you know, I may not, I'm still, I'm old, okay? And they can relate to their peers. And so the peers become the go-between. And we tell our students, you, as a student leader, you have now given up the right to disagree publicly with your band director. Okay, and that would be even at junior high, you know, because you're instilling something in them that's maturity and learning how to, how to deal with adults, learning how to deal with their peers, and if they're going to go and say, you know, Vendrick said this and I disagree, uh, well, they just ruined everything that you, you're trying to instill. So, you know, we use our kids to be a go-between between the director and the student body to kind of communicate the ideals and, and the, the thoughts that we want our program to become. Does that make yeah. sense? That totally makes sense. And I actually want to hear from all four of you on how do you utilize student leaders in your program? Hmm. I forgot. I got to say something. I got to say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> this, this is so important. I'm sorry. Sorry. Stop, Corey. This is so important. <laughs> Your student leaders have to be willing to be humble servants. I know people don't want to hear that, but it is so true. You know, I know we hear a lot about servant leadership, but what actually is it? It is literally the student, because students tell us all the time, once they become a leader, it, it's totally different than what I thought it was. I thought it was a title. I thought I was going to be able to, you know, be in charge of someone. You know, that's I, I could get the pizza is. first. Yep. <laughs> and it's totally opposite. I have to be willing to go that low place for everybody in my program because there are some people in my program that are in a low place, and I can't reach them. But but my flute player can or my trombone player can. And so they have, I have to train them how to go to maybe that low place with a kid who's having a struggling time, you know, because I can't. So humility, care, and a desire to serve, I think are, are really important aspects to have. I don't care if they're a sixth grader or 12th grader. Those are still things that they need, you need to um, foster in your leaders. Okay, y'all go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tag on to that to Rory um, because I, I love those words that you used and one of the things I love to do um, is teach young people about leadership and I may not necessarily use that exact vocabulary but I work hard to teach those character traits so that when they get in high school they're they're gung-ho um, I do a, real, a really different, and my school is a 7-8 campus, so um, my beginners are not on my campus. I've never seen them before. They're taught by totally different staff, um, so they're just two grades, so I know half of them. I don't know the other half. My um, Our leadership team is basically the eighth graders who are two-year members of the top band. Um, no elections, no um, nothing like that. Um, and it, it very obviously becomes a um, situation where some kids don't want to be a leader, but I expose them to that um, just to let them, you know, put their toes in it. 
Um, and, and what I think um, I, I'm able to do throughout the year is develop the leadership skills of those kids. And usually others come into that group without, and again, no title, um, but the expectation that they will be the servants, they will stay late. And then that whole leadership becomes cool. And, you know, yeah, I'll stay and pick up all the water bottles. That, that's, that becomes cool for them. Um, but mostly um, I think that it creates an accountability system um, among those kids, then everyone wants to do um, do what they're doing. Right now on my class conferences, we're I'm working on leadership skills for my seventh graders and saying, now next year, you're gonna, you know, you're next year, next year to talk about nurturing them to re realize that they've got, if they don't do it, how is anyone gonna know that the expectation is there? So I love leadership um, with little kids, but it's a very, um, it's a tender walk with them because they don't really know what that is yet. And they're a me, 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 me world. So doing things for other people is a little bit challenging. Um, at the same time, I watch them when they go into high school and grow up and become drum major and all the things. So um, it's, I think that everything that Rory said is applicable. Um, you just have to structure it appropriate for the children and their maturity level at the time. Um, for us at Miller, um, we don't have elected <clears throat> leadership stuff either. Um, a lot of what we do is the same kind of thing with Susan. It's, it's the eighth graders that are in the top band uh, are, are basically our, our leaders. And then we, what we try to do from there, like the very first thing I do after we set the bands for the next year um, and we have our camp that when they come back in August, when we do our summer camp, um, I have my eighth graders come up the week before yeah, and we have, we have a meeting with them. And, uh, I, I probably have about, you know, I have all my eighth graders that are going to be in the top group and, um, it's about a half an hour, 45 minute meeting. And, um, I invite the parents and I have some parents that choose to stay. It's not necessarily for them, but they like to come and see what their kids are doing but it's for the kids. And I, and that's the point where I look at those eighth graders and I go, okay, we're about to start our year. Here's what the plan is for the year. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we have to achieve. And now all of you that remember, you know, I always talk about like, you know, remember when you were in seventh grade last year, you had that eighth grader you looked up to, or you had that eighth grader that put, like helped you with your all region music or helped you with your solo or helped you get your pass offs done, did all that stuff. You know, I'd look at them and go, well, who's, Who's that going to be now? Like, because you know that person's at the high school now as a freshman. And so I, I really talk to those guys, like, you know, you, you, to put it in perspective, you know, you guys are the seniors here. And there's an expectation of the senior class that you're going to be able to help and not just continue the success of the program, but to, uh, but to you know, reinvigorate the program and give something back to the program when you leave. And so I use those words a lot with them of like, what are you leaving? Are, are you leaving it in better condition than you found it? Because um, yes. if you know, at the beginning of the year, you know, every year things get keep getting incrementally better. And it's because our eighth graders leave that gift for the next seventh graders. So what are you going to leave for the next group? And so like it's this it's this compound interest kind of thing where they keep paying into the into, into the program. Keep it better. They find more ways to do it. And then from that eighth grade group, what the staff does is we, we start kind of picking off our really top of the top cream of the crop leaders. And we talk to those guys a lot. Like I talk to all those top, top players, those top influential kids. I spend my first couple of weeks just finding those kiddos. If I don't know them, most of them I do. And just talking to them and telling them, you know, and kind of giving them my vision for what we want to do. And like, here's what we need to do. And, I, and or like, you know, if I just had a, a, if I just had a sectional with my band, and, and, you know, when there's a seventh grader struck, and I, I look at, you know, those, those eighth grade leaders, especially the top ones that are the good players, I look and go, can you, can you go work with so-and-so? I think it would mean a lot to them, a whole lot to them, actually, if you could go do that. And then they'll go, you know, just kind of spreading little seeds about that. So that the neat thing is that in the second semester, when we start doing like pass-offs in our music um, and, and, uh, and, you know, in some years I do paired pass offs and I always put a strong kid with a weak kid every year. And it makes those, and what I do with that is like, it kind of gets, it vitalizes what we have. And so the nice thing with that is like, you know, A, all the eighth graders feel ownership and then B, you know, I go in and try to find those, 
you know, try to find those kids that absolutely have to be our leaders. They have to do everything. We need them to do it. And we share how important it is. Um, and then the accountability thing, you know, like, like everyone else has said, if something doesn't, if something's not going the right way, first of all, you know, I'm not above, and I have done this many times in my band hall, like, guys, I let you down, I said the other, we're going to fix it, and here's what we're going to do, because they need to see that, first of all, because they're not used to seeing, they are not used to seeing adults going, it's my, I'm the one that messed up, it's totally on me, it's not on you guys, here's how we're going to fix it, though, and we're, here's what we're going to do, they need to see that, that kind of humility, because that's, that's honesty that they don't get anywhere else, hardly, and then, and then that, that, that gives you the communication to be able to call them out on like, guys, you guys didn't come prepared. This has to be better because then they know it's not just like, it's not just a one-way street. It's very much a, a, a two-way street where both parties are, are contributing to the program. And I, I found success, you know, using that for us. At Roma, we um, have section leaders that are chosen through application. Um, and that application asks like four or five questions and there may be like a follow-up in-person question. I want to know, and I feel like it's really important that you get your non-varsity and some non-varsity kids involved in that process too, because they need to figure out how to be a leader within their own ensembles as well. And um, I think it, it makes a big difference to know that maybe your future drum majors are coming from your sub non-varsity band. Like I've seen that come happen before and I want them to have that opportunity to gain leadership skills. Um, I do sometimes have seventh graders that are a part of that and they are the section leaders and I want them that that's a great candidate for me too. to be like well this is our role model you go handle this and you go tell other section leaders this is what Mr. Graves is expecting out of you this week. Um, I also it's easier for me to have them all as eighth graders because fortunately enough um, my lunch periods are specifically for whatever grade is happening at that time so my eighth grade like during eighth grade lunch my eighth graders can come practice during seventh grade lunch my seventh graders can come practice so I always use that time on every Monday to have a meeting with all those kids and so we're going to talk about what's happening during that week or that's a great time for me to say hey your band didn't do this this week what are you doing about it now you know what I'm doing about it but what are you doing what is your part why doesn't Sarah still not have a pencil do you know where the pencils are can you pass out the pencils like so I think two the more communication you give them and they know, okay, I'm expected to do this, this is my job, then I think your um, band program starts to have the excellence that you're looking for too. And while we're on uh, while we're on leadership, do any of you all have leadership activities that you use or that you're familiar with that you help to foster that leadership with your kiddos? <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I would be willing to bet that however many people are on here, that 98% of you were leaders in your own school and probably, or no, definitely, you had some kind of Dr. Tim in your life at some point or another. Um, and if you haven't, then you need to Google him. But <laughs> I think that that all of us have learned leadership from at some, you know, some point or another and we, you can continue to use those things. Um, I, I mean, there's so many things that I, that I still use that I heard my first years of teaching in some kind of clinic or some kind of seminar. Um, but if you're interested in, be, in how to teach leadership and how to instill it, read the books, get the John Maxwell, get the Eat That Frog, um, uh, uh, um, the magic of thinking big. Read the um, book or or the YouTube of, um, that was at UT's graduation a few years ago. Um, if you want to change the world, start by making your bed. Like if you feel like this is a deficiency for you, read the stuff. Um, and I started to do that uh, when I was teaching high school. Um, I was uh, we it was a brand new high school. There were no, the kids didn't know leadership yet, and I just started ordering all the books and. Um, so if, if it's something, I mean, and I'd be willing, I mean, I, I love all that stuff. Um, who moved my cheese? That's one too. Like, if you are curious about it, order the book. I'll give you the books um, if you're like a young first year teacher. Um, but the more you read and the more you learn, um, then the more comfortable you feel about it. And like what Chris said, the humility of I messed up. That was my fault. And they can't, they, he's right. Like they can't handle that. They, they're not used to that. 
Um, and so that whole student leadership, ownership, accountability just comes back around and around and around. But if you're, if it's something you're not sure about how to nurture, order the books. And if you want the booklet, I even have that all typed up from some, from something else. So I, I'm a really big, um, uh, reader of personal development and like you are, uh, um, you're the badass book, you're badass, um, um, wash your hair, like all of that stuff. That's good stuff for how to teach people to believe in themselves and believe in the bigger picture. Okay. I just got excited about all that. Sorry. Go, oh, go. While, while you're going, saying that I'm going to, for those of you who couldn't catch all that, I'm, I tried my best <laughs> to write that down. So if you look in the chat, I put some authors that you can uh, get hip to. Oh, good. Yeah. Put the, put the authors. You know, one of the just simple little activities we did was you know, we called it instrument clubs. And some of you probably do a lot of things like this, but it's where we would have certain kids, our leaders, you know, they would do an instrument club like trumpet club. And John is a former student of mine, so he knows about this. But the reason we did it, we, our school was in a place where it was a new area and they were building new schools like crazy. And they would build a new school and our school would split and the band population would drop. And it's like, oh my goodness, here we go. And that happened like three or four times. And so we had to create something to keep, like the year after a, a split, the number, the beginner number would be low. And it's like, how are we gonna keep all these kids? And so we took our leaders and we said, hey, why don't y'all do the instrument clubs during advisory? And so what they would do is they would start a club and they'd put up signs that said, hey, trumpet club is gonna meet, you know, during advisory on Thursday. And then our best kids or most leadership were, and it wasn't always the best player, but it, they had to be able to do their stuff. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes it was personality driven also. And they would meet, give kids tickets or some kind of special invitation. And they would come into advisory. And those kids would teach maybe what the first year band kids were learning that year. It would always be, I mean, that week, it would always be first year band kids. And the kids in the top band would be the ones that were leading the club. So like John was the club leader, you know, he would, kids would come in and they'd sit down in the room and then they, the student leaders would get up on the podium and say, okay, y'all are working on line eight or y'all are doing, learning how to do lip slurs. You know, this is the way the band directors teach us to do lip slurs. And they would be very specific about how they taught it, but because it was student led, the kids loved it and it increased our retention. It increased the vibe in band. Kids got excited. And then they were like, I can't wait till I get major. I want to be, I want to run the saxophone club. I'm like, no, that club doesn't need to happen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you can match how much saxophone club and the percussion club don't need to happen. But anyway, moving <laughs> on. <laughs> but it, it, it became a thing. And even at, to this day at Sinker Ranch Junior High, they still do it because it's been so successful. And it is just a great thing to do at the junior high level. Mind you, you got to have the right kids doing it and you have to monitor it every now and again. But if you have the right kids doing it, they're going to teach what you teach and they're going to allow and not allow what you allow and not allow. And it'll kind of look like a mini version of your own band class. It's really cool. Yeah. So folks, we're getting like, woo waterlogged with great 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 leadership resources you're hearing it check the chat there are tons of awesome authors and a couple book recommendations in there as well um if you have questions guys and please try to keep it to questions i am going to have the chat open so we're, we'll try to get to those um on on this term on this thing about leadership last time we talked about accountability and we talked uh, we had mentioned um uh, objective sheets as a method, one of the many million ways that we can keep kids accountable uh, in band. So I, I do want to kind of dive a little bit deeper in, in some sort of an explanation, some sort of a way. Um, and I'm also going to put some objective sheets in the chat. So uh, if one of you wants to, to jump on and talk about how you utilize objective sheets, or if you don't use objective sheets, what you do do to help keep kids accountable. I use objective sheets because it's a good way for the kids to see what it is that they're working on and also what the outline is for them about what's about to happen. Um, if you 
I, if you are going to use one, I think you should add a rubric to it so that you keep yourself honest. Yeah. And so they understand this is why I got the grade that I got. And it's easy, and that's a good way for you to show parents. Well, and it's not a favoritism thing. It's not because I don't like Sarah. But Sarah can't tongue. And Sarah needs to go work on that like I asked her to. Um, it's an opportunity for you to make notes and say, this is what you're going to work on and give them another, if you have the time, which and I, we've got to figure out how to get the time. I think that's why a lot of people don't do them. It says like, when do I do the objective sheet? Um, give them notes and if they can fix it, they're going to come back to you to make up the grade and show you, this is what I worked on specifically so that they're not trying to figure out, well, I know I got a 85, but I'm just kind of fishing in the dark about how to fix it. Um, I think there's also something to be said about making recordings too. If you don't have time to listen to all your kids all the time, Google Classroom is a great way for make, to make those recordings, send them, and that when you do go home, if you have time to keep working on some stuff, and like you, let's just be honest, sometimes we do have to keep the work going on at home, is to grade it then, send them from some feedback, and that way they're not waiting for the next kid to play. And like, this is boring. I hate objective sheets versus, okay, this was an opportunity for me to go practice something and know how to do it. Yeah, I think I see John put some of my objective sheets up there. Yeah, the accountability part is is huge. It, it does. It's such a great planner for the the period of time that the objective sheet lasts. In our case, it's a six weeks. And in this particular objective sheet that um, he put up there is one that happens during a time of our. Um, it's the first semester back or first six weeks back, and we do a, a recital concert. And, but I think there's some scales on there too. I, I, I didn't pull it up in front of me, I'm sorry, but I think there's some scales on there. And like you were talking about a rubric, Corey, you notice it's like four scales equals 100. That changes throughout the course of the year. It could be eight scales, it could be 12 scales. And this is at high school. And, and what the deal is, we don't overload them with objectives, but we have very reachable goals that create um, a pattern of repetition of a particular skill or if they're like for their ensemble objective and um, one of the things they have to do is to pass off an objective they have to get a rehearsal together of their ensemble and we schedule it that it happens one week before the recital concert so they have to give us a video they have to submit a youtube video of them rehearsing their ensemble one week before the actual recital concert. That gives us an idea. Sometimes we do it two weeks, but one week before gives us an idea of where they are. And if we need to do some emergency surgery, <laughs> you know, the week before the, the concert, we can do that. But it also creates accountability, not just for one kid, but for their entire ensemble. So um, on that objective sheet, there are a lot of different things that kids do. And most of them are pass fail. It, it is not, um, it's not a gotcha, you know, it's a, it's a, we call it mastery learning, mastery learning, you know, you just keep doing it until you get it done, you know, and, and it lasts the entire six weeks. And yes, some kids wait till the very last minute. And we try to tell them, don't wait till the last minute, but some of them do. And unfortunately, some of them get to the last minute and they don't get their objectives passed. But when a parent asks, if you look at the bottom of that objective sheet, when a parent says, why does little Johnny have a, a zero on whatever, it says at the bottom, I reviewed my child's objective sheet and fully understand the expectations for the current six weeks. My, my student uh, and I are aware and there'll be no pass offs and whatever, you know, that kind of thing. And it gives them a date. But notice what the first objective is. It's the parent signature in the objective box. And oddly enough, that is one of the hardest things to get is a parent signature on objective number one. And it's objective number one on every single objective sheet, every six weeks, the entire school year. So when the parent says they didn't know, if, and we got that, we make sure that we get that signed too. Like we send emails and everything to make sure we get that thing signed. And we always, sometimes we have to show a parent, here it is, and they go, well, I didn't sign that. <laughs> Somebody did. Somebody did, you know? <laughs> so, and if they say I didn't sign it, well, they got the grade in the grade book that says parent signature, and it's a 100. So maybe you didn't, I don't say, well, you didn't look at your kids' grades, but we do lead them to the grade book, third, six week, or the middle of the grading period, progress reports. We're always trying to communicate those things. 
but it's a great tool of accountability and it doesn't have to be some impossible task. Chris, you want to go or? You can go and then I'll, I'll go uh, Okay. Okay, so I don't do objective sheets um, and I, I, but no, I don't disagree with them. Um, I think, and, and, and I'm sure that we have a lot of young teachers on our, um, in our audience tonight. So I think it's really important that you understand you have to find what works for you and your program and your kids um, and your community. So um, I think that it's awesome. It takes great planning and great, and the accountability um, is really good. I do uh, testing charts. Um, my school uh, is on block schedule. So we, uh, I only see, I see my kids every other day for 90 minutes. Um, we do have sectional, I mean, we do have sectionals and everything. So I see them, uh, I might see them on the off day that I don't have rehearsal with them, but um, I'm just giving you that for a background. So I, uh, and all of our bands, we do testing charts and they're, um, what you see is the one from my top band and the fourth band where they get everything for the whole semester. Um, as far as uh, as far as um, their assessment, um, and we use mastery too because they're using that in Star. When we started using the word mastery, everything elevated. It was really cool. Um, so um, I, I I strongly recommend you adopt that word in your teaching because the kids are like, oh yeah, it's work. I said no, that is not mastery level, and they're like, oh okay, they sit up taller, I, and I love that. Um, but I, I think the, the important thing is plan. And have a, a have a clear picture. You know, um, Rory, you'll probably remember uh, a while ago we had the term backload the curriculum. Start with the end in mind and yes, go backwards. Start with the end in mind, yes. I, I don't I don't think that's that terms is used as much. So figure out what uh, you know what you want them to learn for a specific time period. For us, it's it has to be a semester because you know if you see your kids a hundred times, we're going to see them fifty times. Um, and even though it's the same amount of class time, it's really different with every other day. So um, I just think that uh, whatever works well is what you should adopt. And for us, doing the testing chart works really well because um, the kids know what's happening. Um, and some of them, it freaks them out at the very beginning because it's like, this is too much. But most of them are very grateful to know what they're going to have to do for the whole semester. Like, I'm just going to chime in real quick, too. I think it's important to remember that these are fluid documents, too, because oh, yeah. it's not a year to year thing. And what you may have planned out for the entire six weeks is pro might change by week two. And you need to be able to just go with it. Yes. Yeah. We have closed off objectives or say, you know, objective number five, we're no longer grading objective number five this six weeks. So, you know, life happens, you know. Um, for us, we don't do objective sheets either at Miller, but we do um, a lot of the same things like what Susan does. Um, ours are very much uh, ours are very much around what what we're working on in band class. So, for instance, the first big project for the top two bands at Miller um, is the region band process, and so like they get a full so the, the the top two bands at Miller get a full outline of the entire region band process. For us, we get 10, we get nine or 10 weeks typically. And so it has a rubric that says, this is what we're covering every week in sectionals. You have to keep up with us. Um, it has, this is, what, this is what scales and technical studies we're gonna do every week. Brass players, this is what, uh, this is what uh, flow studies, uh, brass specific exercise we're gonna do every week. And uh, then every three weeks or so, we have a, a, a big uh, project that they have to turn in. Usually it's a scale project, first half of their etude, second half of their etude, it's, it's specific. And so, um, and, then, and so with that, that's the first part of our checking, making sure that they stay on track with us. They know that they have those grades also. Um, and we also do mastery. And really what we do is, is, is I, uh, for us, we, uh, with the top band we do, it's, it's either 100, they can do it, it's a, it's a 60, they can't do it, right. or, or it's like, it's, it's a lower grade than that. No, we can't give zeros. I, I think I've done 170, 50. That's what I typically do with the top band. And because a 70 could mean for a kid, like they can kind of get through it. I don't want to kill that kid's grade and they can come back and play it for me again. But, uh, but uh, you know, and the kids I know appreciate that kind of standard because it's like, I just look at them and go, could you really do that? And they, they I mean, they're smart enough to know so for us, it's either it's either like you got it, it's a hundred, 
It's it's a 70 or it's a 50. It's not going to work. We and, used to do that at Sacred Rest Junior High. Those things for us. Um, and uh, so the mastery thing helps. And then they know that on top of that, then they have our they have our individual listings. So every everything that we do is tailor made. Um, as an objective sheet would be done. And, and I think they're good ideas too. This should just work, works for us. Um, so like in, in addition to their tests like that, uh, they also have their pass-offs that they do with us and they get two grades for their pass-offs. One is just, did they come to their pass-off? And two, it's what's the mastery of the music? Yes. You know, so it's, it's, so I'm glad that you're here, but what did you do <laughs> while you were here? And so, uh, and so <laughs> they get a comment sheet. And so like for our, for our school, uh, whenever we do region band or solo and ensemble, the kids have uh, the kids have um, it's it's usually a double sided page and it's it's di it's divided off into columns and there's room for us to do comments and at the bottom there's a director's signature an attendance grade and a master grade and so then they have to turn that in as their project and the nice thing about that is is they're getting live feedback and they have to be uh, responsible enough to hold on to that document. Because uh, I tell them, like, this is your responsibility. If you lose it, we're starting back over. And if you have to get five pass offs with me, we're going to start back over. Ooh. Been at a Diet Coke because I'm going to be making up that time with you. <laughs> so, um, and so for us, that, that helps. We do the same thing with that with slow ones, where they have a set of, of things that they do for us, pass offs. Um, you know, and we do this. And so our objectives are more run through tests. And things like that and through like having to play off their music for us or doing charms assignments or things like that um, one thing our staff is talking about next year um, because we've had we've kind of been able to play with the, the technology a lot with this distance learning stuff is we're actually wanting to to kind of transcend to everything is portfolio based by nine weeks and so what our intention is we're kind of looking at it but like we want to give the list a kid a list of these are the things that we would like you to have. Here's the rubric you're going to go off of. And we want them to start preparing a portfolio like they would do for their college, like, like their upper level classes. And they can do that at their own time frame, their own leisure. And they can do it as many times as they want. Um, but we wanted, we, we wanted to move in that direction so that A, it would put more, more accountability on their end. They have many times they want, they're in complete control of their grade. And, um, and then we give them feedback and help them with that. And um, that, that's something, you know, we, we, you know, either utilizing smart music, that kind of stuff. So that's what we do to help with accountability in, at Miller. And one last thing I'll add about that, I think we're all really focusing on our top band kids. If you have kids that aren't grade driven, then you have to revise all of this. And, and sometimes it's not about the grade at all that they have to learn. Really, I just want you to learn this. This is good for you. This is like your good broccoli and cauliflower. So <laughs> I, I mean, let's, let's all, a lot of, it's a lot of times it's real easy to talk about your top band kids who just, they want to do their best no matter what. They just got that drive in them. But the, um, the kids who aren't grade driven don't care what their grades are, that they, they have to learn it's just good for them to learn and that you want them to learn it for learning it, not for a grade. Well, and you know, I, I will say you're right, Susan. And you know, um, when you have multiple bands, you, you do have to be cognizant of all the kids at every level. And I will tell you at the high school, you know, how it is. I, we have four bands and the fourth band, a lot of times people say they, Oh, those kids don't want to, I will tell you because of the way we do the system, Monday is objective turn in day. You know, and so we literally, like at the beginning of the six weeks, we literally have them come up and bring their objective sheet, whether it's signed or completed or not, one student at a time. And we do that even in high school. And it is the freakiest thing in the world. But do you know that now that I've been at Sink Ranch, this is my uh, third year at Sink Ranch High School, and coming from Sink Ranch Junior High, and do you know that the fourth band kids have an extremely high rate of objective completion, whereas at the beginning, they did not. And they're not your quote unquote grade driven always, but they are success driven because there is something in that objective sheet that allows them to be successful. And once something good happens for them, it starts to create this vibe. And when the trumpet player next to me gets up and goes and gets a sign and we're like, yep, great job. 
I even do stickers in high school. I'm not gonna lie to you. Kids will do anything for a sticker. Like, they, well, they I will do. I'll they do anything for a sticker. They lose their mind, you know. And it's like I, I even have a stamp that has a smiley face on it. I'm like, give me your hand. Stick you up. And, and they're just like, oh, you know. And but my point is, it's not. It, it we create something that the top kid in the program <laughs> and the not top kid in the program can do and be successful, and want to come back and do it again. Now, Mr. Davis, or you, you hit something there, and Susan, you talked about this earlier, and Chris, you had kind of alluded to this earlier, but the, what is the value of being patient and, and following through with the things, that the systems that you set in place? Well, if you don't see it, then you're never going to see the end result of it. I think that's, that's what a lot of the time the issue is. Uh, yes. Kids and even us as teachers need to learn the, the benefit of delayed gratification. We're in this era where everything happens so quickly and like, oh yes, well I can text and they're gonna get this message. And then we have the audacity to get mad when the text message doesn't go through five seconds later. <laughs> like, well, so you can imagine what a sixth, a sixth grader feels like when they still can't cross the break without squeaking. Like it's a, it's, an on, it's a continuous process and you just have to foster that and say, it'll get there and be the champion who says, I, you didn't get it yet. This is how you're gonna fix it. But when they finally do get it, you praise the snot out of it and make them feel like this is a huge victory because that's what their band career is gonna be like. That's not just gonna be in sixth grade. When you get to seventh grade, look how much like blacker the page gets. Like that music gets so much harder, so much, <laughs> so much faster. And so you're gonna have to be a continual cheerleader and talking about and that's and that is why objective sheets for me are good. And right. that's why timelines are good because you need to see, look, we're in week one, look where you have to be by week 12. You're, I'm not asking you to do week 12 and week one. This is how you're gonna build to it. Yeah, you said something about patience and, and y'all as a band director, that's one of the things that we tend not to have yet in order to develop this thing that we're trying to develop over the course of a year, if you're gonna be successful, you gotta have patience. It, it, I mean, we don't think back to what it looks like when a kid walks in your band classroom in the sixth grade and doesn't have a clue about what what that thing is in that box that they're getting ready to open. You know, I don't know if y'all do the angel voices, you know, the first day that you <laughs> open the, the video, oh, you know, when you open the instrument, it's like the greatest day in the world. They have no clue, but then that same kid two years later is like a rock star or maybe not, you know, but the point being is patience. If, if you're not like, of course, if you're not willing to see it through, and I think, I'll tell you now, I won't go on a tangent, but it's one of my biggest things with band directors is when they start to develop, when they start to hear that song that they're working on, when they begin to hear it, they move on to the next thing. Mm. That is one of the worst things you can do as a band director when you're teaching music and your band starts to, and you get bored with where you are, so you move on. It, you'll find that that's, that thing happens all throughout everything you do in your program if that's what you do so you got to have some stick to itiveness if you will when it comes to whatever skill or whatever you're trying to develop in your program is we use the phrase relentless dedication like relentless dedication to excellence to relent i mean like it doesn't matter how hard it is you just keep going until you reach that level or that level of excellence and that's not a rating or a trophy that is what we know we can achieve so that patience the patience has to be there for that relentless dedication then of course i have to teach them what those words mean but that's what we do um, and that's me too I, i'm i'm sorry i'm i am not going to accept that because that's not what we what our goal is so the patience has to be there but you have to believe in what you're trying to do and make sure that that's right. And if it's not working out, got to check yourself or <laughs> get a, a yourself, mentor to you. check you. I mean, you you got to. I heard it here, Susan. My yeah. Well, hey, I mean, Thug life. You know, <laughs> look in the mirror. If it's not working, and and you know you've had relentless dedication, then check it out and or ask somebody that you trust. Hey, is this is this worth you know is this worth the tears and the 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 torn up fingernails and all that because. If it's, yeah. ah. So this, this is actually a really good segue into developing ourselves, 
what are some ways that we can get better as band directors so that we don't get stuck so that we don't or that, so that we continually improve what are what options are there for band directors what do you mean so do we have is, is it you know last time you did like that poll years of yeah. years of teaching i think the answer will depend on numbers right. of years of teaching here we go folks there is a oh. poll asking how long you have been teaching Fill it out college now that. How's that? I'm in college now. <laughs> Continual learning. There you go. Roy Davis is first chair, everyone. No, sure. no, no, first no, year no, college. no. I didn't say which band. But uh, sure. there. <laughs> <laughs> you know my story. Last year hero. Call down that third part. Look, All right, play. folks. And here, here are the results. <laughs> of who we got today awesome okay that's kind of what I'm, that's i'm a two percenter hey wait oh, no, shout a... out to the student teachers y'all Woo! Woo! <laughs> hang in there we got you i promise we got you <laughs> the question was how do we how do we keep learn how do we keep learning yeah how, how do we continue to improve ourselves well all these one to five these people in the red y'all got to like just like hang on because it, you get past that five and you're going to be better, but it's hard and people don't tell you that. And I'm going to tell you right now that it's hard. I've had so many colleagues um, that have like, they haven't made it the five years. I'm not my band colleagues, just teacher friends. They didn't make it that five years because you think like, oh, I got, th I'm good. I made a one sight reading. I'm a, you just got to hang in there till five years. And then you will start to realize, I don't know a damn thing. And then you start to go, oh, teach me the things. I mean, I'm just telling you the truth because I want y'all to be successful and like student teachers, mm, please ask people, when you're about to accept a job, please ask people that you respect, is this person going to be a good mentor for me? Now, I want y'all to get a job. I get, I get it. But ask, like, you got to get a good mentor and then you, you've got to be, be kind to yourself and give yourself grace and love the children and leave your crap off the podium and get up there and do your very best every single day, every single minute. And they'll give back their very single best. They're very, very much best. And it but is like, rare. It is rare that you're gonna be a superstar, you know, the day one or something. You know, I, 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 don't, I was talking to my wife earlier about, you know, just, we we're just talking about life and different things going on in perspective and no one went into, I didn't go into this uh, attempting to accomplish this, that, or the other. That wasn't, that wasn't a goal. And I, I just wanted a job and I knew that I wanted to be a band director and I knew that I wanted to, to give back what I had in me. But what happened was I met some people and I started doing what they were doing and they just, I just took what they had and put my own spin on it and it worked. You know, and, and it was my personality, but really it was their information. I'm not giving yep. you information that I created. I, I may give you information that I shape for me, right. but you have to shape that information for you. And that's how you get better at, at your craft. But, you know, for me, I'm a people person. God created me to be a people person. That, that, that's who I am. That's how I relate. And so when I'm in front of people, at the end of the day, and any of these people that know me will tell you, at the end of the day, when I come home, I'm like, okay, God, did I do what I, what I needed to do? You know, I, I, and when I do that, then I know that the people in front of me are getting what they need to get for that class that day. I do seek information, though. I do need to know my craft. You got to know your craft. You can't just walk in, hi, oh, I love you all. Yay, TGB. No, that's not how it works, right? You got to know your stuff but you also have to be a compassionate, caring, loving individual, wanting those people in front of you to get better and be better. And I'm done. So Perfect. I have something to share um, uh, that I got like, no lie, my very first TBA, the fall of the summer of 1990, and I went with Lauren Bachelor's mama, who's on this call. She's about to be a band director. That just blows my mind. 
um, my very first TBA, and I heard a clinic by Wade McDonald. If you don't know that name, you need to look it, look it up. And he said, um, he said this poem that his dad had used or made, uh, and his dad was a great band director too. It hung in my band office for 30 years. I just brought it home because I just retired. Um, and I, I have to find a place to hang it. Okay. So like, I want you to read, I'm going to see if I can do it. I want you to read it close. Okay. Wait, mm -hmm. let me read it to you. Cause I don't know if I can do that. This is by, <laughs> by Fred McDonald this day. Cause this picks up what Rory just said. Oh, I'll probably cry this day. I will teach with the enthusiasm of my first year of teaching. I will be as interested in details as if it were the day before contest. Here's the big one. I will remember that every student has the right to expect an exciting and interesting and loving experience in my class. I will teach with love and compassion as if I knew that this was the final day that God would allow me to teach. And y'all, I hung this in my office and it was in a fancy frame. Actually, it was a, it used to be in an orange frame for my first job, West Memorial. And then it was all maroon from, um, from uh, uh, Cinco Ranch. But I took the frame out and I just put it in plastic. I, mean, I have it sitting right here because I feel, I mean, I'm still going to teach forever. So that whole thing Rory just said about like, did you do your best? And if you didn't, you got to like reboot. But that whole thing, I will teach with loving, I mean, y'all, I read this just like, in February, make sure I'll teach. As, like if this is the last day God allowed me to teach, I got to do my very best. So, okay, so, now she, now Vincent's asking, oh, how do you program? We got to get no, back. Hold on, hold on. Uh, wow. Stop your We're not ready for programming. <laughs> Susan, is there a way that you can like either take a picture and send that to me, and I can share that with the group? That'd be awesome. I will. I would yes, like that actually. yes, no, it is that's... just. I don't know. And and if you, I mean, the fact that I heard Mr. McDonald say that about his dad. His dad was my husband's band director in college. Like this, it's just pretty special. Um, yeah, I'll send it right now. Vincent Morris has also been so kind as to drop the link to where it's at. So speaking of, of resources, uh, oh. especially for all you non-Texas people, you can go to the TBA, Texas Bandmasters Association website, and it has clinics stretching back to, I want to say 2002, uh, and all those handouts from there. Um, so now, since Vincent's ready to move on to the harder stuff, here we go. How do you program for both a varsity ensemble and a sub non-varsity ensemble? I think you have to program keeping like goals in mind, but making sure it's level appropriate. Um, I don't think that I would ever think that my varsity band should play uh, different, well, they're going to play harder music, but they're still going to meet certain goals in the process. And I think it's also important to keep an, an idea that you've got to teach a wide set of music throughout the school year. So the kids need to be exposed to marches. They need to be exposed to music that transitions. They need to be exposed to music that's multi-movement because they, they need to learn about how themes carry across. Um, I think if you just keep in mind an overarching idea of I'm giving my kid a well-rounded education and keep it um, in a way where you're going to expose the weaknesses, but not at contest. And you're gonna get those kids to be better. You gotta expose the kids to lyrical music. Well, I mean, I say I say that like uh, people I think are under this impression that you have to play a lyrical piece at, at UIL. And that's not true. If your band isn't ready for it, then don't do it. No one says that you have to, um, cause they're going to like, they're gonna tell you that you should have done it. So play, play it at your fall concert, play at your spring concert when you're ready for it. But you also need to be able to teach your weaker sections and make them better. Uh, they have to be exposed. Like, and I'm not, this shouldn't be from an embarrassing standpoint, but like if you're, if you want to play, ever play harder music or music that they're going to deem fun for everybody, then everybody's going to have to do their part in, in that. So. Um, the way out, sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Chris, I apologize, go ahead. Okay. Um, like for me, whenever I'm, I'm, I'm looking at programming for all of our bands at like, like a Miller, um, I, I, and we, we've said this a couple of times tonight. Um, I, I usually, I usually program with the end in mind. And so like, uh, every, every day, every year going into the summer, I have a list of pieces and stuff that I want to play, stuff that I think is great to play and would great, would be an awesome experience for kids and this, that, and the other. And then I look at the, and then I look at the things that I want to play and I go, okay, the first thing is as a director, can I teach all of this in the time frame that I have? 
And then we start looking at the skill sets that are needed. You know, if, I, if I'm going to play a piece that has a, a major oboe soloist, I don't have an oboe soloist. I got to either do one of two things, either find another piece or start training up an oboe soloist fast. And so <laughs> but you do that when you're in the middle of UIL season, you do that beforehand. And so, so for me, I'm always thinking about, and, and this is what, what we do with all the bands at Miller, you know, we'll sit down in the summer and we'll start going through, you know, we'll have like a, a short list of pieces that we want to do with the bands, you know, during our UIL season. And then we'll look at those and go, okay, are those obtainable? And then we'll go to the next layer of what do we need and what do we have to teach? And then we'll work backwards and we'll use the Christmas concert music to help teach concepts and skill sets. We'll use, this, we'll use the fall concert music to teach concepts and skill set. Um, for instance, if I know that I'm going to play stuff that's in 6-8 or 9-8 or five, whatever, I better play something in between somewhere that, that does 6-8 or does something before I get there. Um, with, uh, you know, if I'm going to need soloists, I need to develop them along the way. I need to make sure that I, I talk to those lesson teachers ahead of time and make sure that they're developing them with their solos for solo contests. Uh, with, the, with the lower bands, you know, you really, you know, with, with all the bands, really, the music needs to be obtainable. It needs to be something that's never going to put them in a situation that they can't sound good on with with good work, because of course you don't want something you know easy where they'll not be interested, but you don't want to set them up to, to something that they won't be able to achieve, because what they'll do, uh, no matter how great the kids are, the kids will eventually figure out there's they're smart they'll figure out we can't do this, and so you want the kids to feel like it's obtainable. You want them to be excited about the piece of music. You know, I would also urge you when you're talking about programming, if you're looking at programming UIL music, you do need to go look at UIL forms. You do need to look at Bryn Park. You need to look at places that give you data because there's a reason why certain pieces get more twos and threes than another one. And it's not just because the band that played it. It's like, like, like it, this isn't on the list anymore, but you know, Portrait of a Clown by Frank to Kelly, that, that, that's a portrait of a two right there. <laughs> that's what I was all told it was called. I, I sat, a, sat at a pre-OIL with Jack Ferris one time and he looked at me and he goes, you're never allowed to play this piece, ever. Doesn't matter how good the band is. And so, um, and, but there's reasons for that. So, so do your research, look online. Um, you know, one thing I do, even with, even with all the bands at our school, I look at other programs around the state and go, like, man, I, like, are they playing this? Because, okay, this is really good. We could probably do this. Or... You know, or if I start looking at UIL forms, I go, wow, there's a lot of people making threes on this piece. We probably shouldn't do that. And so um, I would do that. And then also, like I said, work backwards, you know, teach with the end in mind. And then like Corey was saying, like, if you don't play a slow, pretty piece at contest, that's okay. But they should still be exposed to that. <laughs> that for them in their spring concert when it doesn't, when, when, when it's just all about the musical experience and not about anything else that kind of goes into it. So it's important to look at that as well. Yeah. I, okay. I to, oh, go ahead, Susan. Go ahead. I, I'm going to go a little old school on this. All right. I um, it, yeah. There, yay, internet. But before the internet, we went to people, we went to contest and heard bands. And that's how, and then looked at the program and we would write things down and say, that was good or I like that. Okay, just because you like it or just because I heard a recording, that sounds cool. That is not a reason to play that a piece of music. Um, like you, you got to know more about it. All right, so Chris said, look on UIL forums. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip that around. Don't go necessarily by that ranking thing. Uh, Big Sky Roundup is a grade one, but not for the clarinets. <laughs> it's a strong grade two for the clarinets. So like you're going to say, oh, Big Sky Roundup is going to have 57 <laughs> votes. It might not work for your band. So I, I'm going to go back to look, you got to look at the score and look at the ranges and then at, look at UIL forms for programs that you respect and see what they play. I'll be honest right now. I am creeping on Chris Bennett and what he plays. I used to creep on Rory Davis when he played at Sinker. I mean, I right now, y'all, dig around. See what people were going to play. If that's still up there, to me, that's sad. It's almost like a memorial. For, but <laughs> like, look and see what everyone was going to play and the programs that you respect. And then ask, like, if you're a young teacher, please ask 
please ask the people that you respect. And, and I will say that's not a good piece. Like a lot of things are played often, but they're not necessarily good music or worth. Uh, what does Gary Williams say? The juice not worth the squeeze. And if it's not worth it, find something that's better for the kids. They deserve that. So listen and don't listen in person if you can. And don't just hear it. on Like if you're going to listen to it on the um, on J.W. Pepper, make sure you watch the score, too. And look at the clarinet ranges. Okay, and go to YouTube add, and listen to all different kinds of recordings. So you'll hear the, yes. the good and the bad. Yes. I want to add, like add like... if you can't get past measure two, you shouldn't play it anyways. <laughs> exactly. It's got, right, a uni- it's got the unison stuff in there that you can't even get past that. You shouldn't even do that, that mess. Go ahead and pass that to your extreme left. Thank you. And by the way, I, I learned I to have a clown on my own. <laughs> so one thing I do, yes, 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 and yes. But the biggest thing I do when it comes to programming, and I'm a sound guy. I, it, it's about what does the band, you know, when you finish, like, what is the sound that's coming from that band, you know? And I am, the first and foremost thing I do is what, I have to know my band. You have to know your band. And that's relational. Because you can pick the music, and you can listen to the music, and you can study the score, and you can say, I have the players, but is that band in front of you going to do what it takes to get that done on those days when you don't want to and they don't want to does that band have that fortitude to get through that because those days are going to happen so as i'm picking music for my band i always pick music that i think is going to make my band sound good based on the band i have that year now yes there are years where i'm like you know i want to play x piece and that's fine and I, I may have a few of those, but then I get to going in that school year and I'm like, you know what, what I thought this band was, they may not be that this year or the personality that I thought this band had, they may not have that personality. And I will tell you, I remember I, I did a program one year and the, the middle piece was in the shining of the stars. And I remember, Ooh, I remember uh, that I, was, was my band. very first UIL. And a band director told me, it was coming time to advance through the honor band process and they were like man you know we just listened to your your band at the region level and man it was so no he's no he was on his way he goes he goes i know what you're playing already and i was like oh my gracious i can't believe somebody said that you know and uh but he goes i would not program in the shining of the stars and he wasn't on my panel he was on another panel and he goes, I would never program that because he goes, it, it's going to get booted out in the first round. But your band sounds really good. That band was fifth and, and finals on a band, you know, even though it, it wasn't going to work. Because I do what makes that band sound good, not necessarily what the grade level is, although I do consider that. But it's within it, that program has got to have moments. And the moments come from what that band is capable of doing over the course of time that we're teaching them. So know your band, know what's going to make them sound good and what's going to bring out the best in the ensemble that's in front of you. And that's at every level, even sub, sub, sub (laughs) non-varsity. And y'all that shining of the stars was freaking amazing. Cause I it it, it, everybody said, don't play it. You were around then, weren't you? You And I don't recommend playing it, but Rory's, like I cried. It's like, deceptive. It looks so easy. It's not. Look it up. And I need to say, I didn't creep on Corey Graves' uh, programs because he, he wasn't, he's, he's young. young. Yeah, he <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Like I didn't, that, that's why I didn't say Corey's. I mean, not that you're not young too, Chris, but I just known you for longer. But um, um, can I, can I say a couple things? Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I know. So back to um, um, how do you, uh, being a good director and keeping your personal development and stuff, all that. Um, I'm going to, and I don't know Corey really well, but I feel like I can say, I I believe that Corey Graves did not start his teaching career with this. I'm going to be, I'm going to win honor band before. I don't know how old you are, but like, I, I, I know that like he was trying to just be a great teacher and because he's a great teacher, these great things happen. Like you, you can't start off with uh, this. uh, uh, Okay. uh, An achievable and reasonable goal. Well, it's not, it wasn't for Corey, but like, you, you've got to just try to do your very, very best and try to make kids better for it. Um, that's my one. And my two was, um, I forgot. Uh, it'll come back to me because it was good. 
Uh, um, this, on, on the, are y'all good for two more questions? Are we good for two more questions? I'm folks? good. Yep. Yep. All right. Here we go. Um, what advice do you have for selecting music for an ensemble that you're still relatively new to? Um, you need if, if if there's another staff member that's been in that building more than you, ask them. Um, I would also recommend you know you know if you're not used to your ensemble, especially if you're a younger teacher, you know programming easier music that's more approachable that has fewer margins for error is always a good approach. Um, one thing that, you know, I've, I've, I've helped out our guys at the high school a lot, like at Dawson, the, the, new, the new teachers that are there, you know, I'll always kind of help them their first year or two, just kind of help them like, okay, this, this you know, because most of the music they play the second, third band there, or fourth band, I've, I've done at some point, or judged. And so, you know, the thing I'll talk to them about as they're trying to figure out their band is, well, first of all, you know, try to find ways that you can learn about them either by doing listenings or, or in sectionals. And then I always tell them don't over program and be very careful and find pieces that if you make a mistake in the teaching process, it's not going to bite you so much in the end. Because that's what can happen if you take a bigger bite out of something when you don't know if your kids are going to do it. And so or if they can. So I would just urge, first of all, some caution and uh, pick, pick music that is fun, of course, but pick music that, you know, may have a few more margins for error than other pieces. Talk to people that have been in that band hall more than you and ask them what the culture is like. How are those kids? You know, how uh, do they practice? You know, are they great rehearsal? Those types of things. Um, I mean, I've even done when I've, when I've replaced people at jobs, I've even asked the outgoing director before, you know, what, what sort of pieces were you thinking about for next year or do, what do you think might work or what are some strengths just so I could kind of learn more about them. Um, and I've done the same thing when I've left a job and I've told the, the, the person who got the job after me, like, this is what I was thinking and this is what I think it could be just to kind of give them some ideas of that. Um, and then I would also make sure that you don't feel like you have to do it on your own, you know, record your band, get people in there to help you, send recordings to people to help you um, you know, and do it early on so that everyone can be a part of the plan when you're starting to develop music for, or pick music for, for concerts and contests. And get a clinician to come early before you're ready for a clinician, get the clinician that time, and they can probably hear a little bit more than you can hear at that time. But get a clinician in September, even this mm -hmm. year, I mean, hopefully we'll, or before you're ready for it, get a clinician. Um, I okay. remember the other thing. So really quick, it was about the programming. Make your bucket list, have it, like have it there and know that it'll be there your whole career. And I <laughs> promise, I mean, you can pick things out of your bucket list all forever. Um, I, 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 when I first got to McCullough, uh, I wanted to play Corral and Shaker Dance. It was just in my heart. I had to play Corral and Shaker Dance. Everybody told me not to play Corral and Shaker Dance. Even my husband, who was the, at that point, uh, my clinician, and don't play it, don't play it. And I was hell-bent and determined to play it. And I'm glad I did. But I absolutely understand now why I was told not to play it because the scoring is all weird. So have your bucket list. And if someone tells you not to play something on it, does it, you don't have, you can still do your own thing. But um, I don't, don't, um, don't run away from pieces that you love or that you really want to play because someday you, you, if you work really hard and do your best, you'll get to, you'll get to get everything on your bucket list. That's an age thing, Susan, because it was on my bucket list in my first year at Sinker Ranch High School. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're like, ooh, yeet. No, yeah. I'm like, I'm glad, I love it. Still love oh, okay. it. Okay. Well, high school, yes. I, junior high, probably, mm, it was I hard. wanted to do it in junior high, but I chickened out. There you go. I dropped a PowerPoint in the group. So if you wanted oh. to look at that there is it was an in-service on selecting literature cool. so maybe there's some things in there you can take from it and before we get to our last question folks exciting news i've i've secured the next few weeks through may of what our schedule looks like so on monday we have beginning sax pedagogy with the wonderful jim shaw hey jim he's on and here. then yeah i think yeah jim's on here Hey, y'all, he's got a really awesome PowerPoint. He's the real deal. 
He is the real deal. Now, next bring Thursday, the tongue, Jim, bring the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> next Thursday, we have Randall Standridge coming on. And he's going to be sharing some thoughts with us about band and composition and kind of exploring his life. The next Monday, we have percussion, beginning percussion with Eric Rath, one of the finest band directors in our state. And then the following Thursday, you've heard from him tonight, but you're going to get a full sermon that next, so not next Thursday, but the Thursday after from Mr. Rory Davis on so intonation, balance, and blend, Reverend. getting your daily drill right. So he's going to be helping and and bringing that to life for us. Watch out now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really excited about the next uh, the next few weeks here. We have some awesome, awesome folks coming through. Uh, and tonight, another world-class wealth of information coming in. Let's give us a, a hand to our clinicians for tonight. We got thank our thank last question coming. coming in. Thank you. Thank you, all. thank you, guys. And thank you, John, for putting this all together. Thank you. Actually, real in the key. Yes. All right, be safe, everyone. Yes, here's our last question. Oh, if just you're kidding. Oh, you're ready. <laughs> I thought we were done. Okay. I have my food. I'm ready to eat. All right. If you're stepping into a, there we go. If you're stepping into a new position, particularly middle school next year, uh, what should your things to do list consist of as you step into the new role? Ooh, that's not oh. a short answer. That's a whole nother session. <laughs> I, I was gonna say that's a whole. You got to get with your head director, unless you're the head director. I mean, I don't know, it's, man. That's hey, yeah, yeah. Are you the head director? Well, we could we could put that on a thing to answer later, and we don't have to answer that tonight. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to do that. Like, I, I want to do that question justice. I don't think I can do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a that's a big. Oh, that's you definitely email it. Careful step. It's a very careful step. Right. With the people you work with, your collaborators and. The, the the team that's a team thing this, and, i mean and, and the administration and the community there's a yes. whole lot lot going on there mm -hmm. so this this is this this will be our last question somebody sent this to me kind of breaks my heart this is exactly what the message said i've been told young teachers don't always understand how children think or process information what can we do to better reach out to them mm. I talk about this all the time. It's relationship building 100%. And if anybody has a clearer understanding of what the youth wants to somebody who is a, youth, a young teacher. And so I feel sorry for whoever said that to you. Um, if you can create a relationship that is trusting with your kids and that even comes with just kind of knowing what they're even talking about, if their lingo even, I think they're more willing to trust you. Um, and then they will... Um, they're gonna follow along with what you want to do now. As well, wh wh what else? What do you think about that? Before I start going on, Me. anyone else? Anyone else? Well, they learn their things, learn the TikTok and the languages, and I mean, learn the things. Learn the you things, people. Like, or be uh, a, like, just be around them. As they need to know that you're a human. I think that's I think that's what a lot of disconnect come yeah. from because they think yeah. some people think that they can't be silly with their kids and that's the perfect you need to be a ham edutain the crap out of that you know like, and, and it also because it's also about who you're with who you're working with sometimes people are intimidated if you're like Corey, i i'm kind of like that too you know just kind of off the chain kind of guy and but that 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 bothers people sometimes you know people get really uncomfortable sometimes you know but i think relationship that that's the, the best word you got to learn to build healthy, appropriate relationships with the people you lead. It's that simple. And with that, folks, I want to say thank you for coming out tonight. If you want to catch our previous sessions, we're on podcasts now. So you can podcast the mess out of this. Um, the mess. And we're also, we all has, also have our YouTube all channel up and mess. going. So you can check out that as well. Uh, if you haven't liked our Facebook page, give us a like. Love you. All right, and we'll see you guys next Monday with Mr. Jim Shaw on Beginning Ooh. Max Pedagogy. Yeah, you got two right. woos. Look at you. They were in unison, too. <laughs> God bless, everybody. Take care. Right, thank you, guys. Thank you.